on Tuesday. But the good news in this is we're now switching over to Wednesdays. So if you like these webinars, if you feel value in these webinars, please join us on Wednesdays. And I believe that will start in the second week in April. So we look forward to seeing you again on Wednesdays. So welcome, welcome. Honored that you could join us this beautiful Tuesday afternoon. We were just, we actually were just talking about the weather. Um, so here in Edmonton, here in Edmonton area, Enoch Cree Nation, it's a, it's a nice one degrees. I just looked at the weather, one degrees outside, we will take it. And our guest speaker, Christina, she's joining us from Guelph, Ontario. And it's about the same weather happening out there. So what, wherever you are, whatever the weather is, if the sun is shining, um, maybe there's snow happening, hopefully not. Hopefully we've like, you know, transitioned into that spring season. But wherever you are, today. I hope that there is some sort of metaphorical sunshine happening. We walk in creator's world. And even on the hardest days and those longest dark nights, there is always something good, something to extend gratitude towards. So we give thanks, you know, for the gift of this day, a gift of another day that we can walk in good ways, we can acknowledge the land, the waters, the beauty that's all around us, all of our relatives, um, you know, the, the animals, everything. We're surrounded. We never walk alone in creator's world. So that, my friends, is what we give thanks for. So I hope you, wherever you are, you find goodness around you. So welcome, welcome. So throughout today's work webinar, feel free to use that chat box. You might have questions, comments along the way. We love to hear from you. There will be opportunity at the end. We will open it up for any questions that you have. You know, and I also think sh sharing the stories is really important as well. So you might have a little story to share of your own. So today's webinar is archaeology. Oh, dear. Oh, goodness me. Archaeological practice in Ontario. So your history under your care and your control. So archaeological history is a non-renewable resource that belongs to your community. So today you are joining SVS Archaeologic why can I not say this word? Um, Archaeologic. Chris, you're joining Christine and she's going to hook you up with how to say that word the way it should be said. And she's going to discuss how cultural resource management, archaeology in Ontario needs to change to support Indigenous self-determination and how that change can be accomplished. So a really important conversation, really important presentation today. So a little bit about our guest speaker. As I said, she's joining us from Ontario. And also, we love to hear where you're joining us from. So put that in the chat box. We know people join from all across the northern part of Turtle Island. So we love, love, love to hear where you're joining from. So she is a archaeologist, archaeologist. What is hap? She's going to, I don't know what's happening, everyone. Normally I could say that word, no problem. She works closely with S F S V S clients to effectively navigate systems, allowing nations to achieve the goals that matter to them. Her focus is ensuring that the clients she works with have early stage engagement, so important, active participation throughout development projects happening on their land. That's how it's supposed to be. I love that. So she was first inspired to work alongside Indigenous communities in 2016 after she was given the opportunity to work on archaeological um, sites and in the Arctic Cultural Heritage at Risk Project in the Northwest Territories. So I think she's bringing with her some great knowledge this afternoon. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Archaeology and History from the University of Toronto. As she, drum roll, I think it's really important to acknowledge this major achievement. She's going to complete her Master of Science 
from the University of Toronto this year. That's exciting. We celebrate with you where her research is focused on cultural value determinations, heritage legislation, land development laws, and the intersection of cultural resource management ethics with reconciliation efforts and Indigenous rights activism. Beautiful. So we are so honored that you are here. Um, and we're honored that all of you are here to listen to, you know, part of this journey with the Links to Learning webinars, really building our own capacity, growing and listening to the story, being inspired and walking away a little bit stronger, maybe having ideas for our nations and for the organizations that we're part of, because this is the journey is to try to make our circle stronger. And then also, you know, create that space where we honor the Indigenous knowledge and those systems. So this is a great conversation. We welcome you, Christina, and thank you. And I'm going to pass this virtual mic over to you. Thank you, Michelle. And now I feel like I am going to say archaeology wrong just because, you know, archaeology works. I think that's also standard across the practice. Um, yeah, thank you for that introduction. I feel absolutely honored to be doing this today. So I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, let's see, fingers crossed. Someone's going to have to unmute and tell me if they see it when they see it. Okay, do we yes. see that? Great. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So Indigenous led archaeology in Ontario challenges and opportunities. Um, I want to just start out by saying that I was talking about this before beginning. I do not love um, these virtual spaces for presenting. I find that it's very difficult to sort of speak into a void. So like Michelle said, please, please, please uh, take part in the chat. It's, it's helpful for me when it pops up just to remember that people are actually here. Um, that will be monitored throughout this presentation. So let's get going. Okay, so I wanna start this presentation off on the right foot. I'm privileged to be sitting in my home today in a house that resides within the Dish With One Spoon territory. It's important to recognize that all of the country called Canada resides on traditional unceded and or treaty lands of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. My home is located within the Between the Lakes Purchase Treaty 3, the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit it's also recognized the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee people have a unique and long-standing and ongoing relationship with the land and each other, and that the Attawandaran people are also a part of this archaeological record. So I've got a little bit of an agenda here today. Um, I'm happy to kind of go off of it whenever is necessary. I want to outline what my intention and hope is for this presentation being cognizant of the fact that this is a pretty big topic um, and we do have minimal time. So my goal today is for you to hopefully come away with a better understanding of what the current constraints of the provincial and federal system are and where there's opportunity for leverage and agency right now. But I'm also hoping that I can illustrate where archeology span can go in the future and how that future can be more in line with self-determination and self-governance for indigenous communities. I'm really hoping that this webinar can encourage conversation, uh, conversation between archeologists and indigenous communities, between archeologists and other archeologists, academics, CRM. Really, I'm just kind of hoping that this can start some sort of conversation if those conversations aren't already being had. I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation, anyone listening will also feel comfortable sending me an email or giving me a phone call if they want to discuss these issues and ideas more. Um, I'm going to include my contact information at the end of this presentation. And when I say feel comfortable, I mean, really, like, just message me and, and we can we can talk about anything archaeology. So SVS, Shared Value Solutions, is where I work. Um, who are we? We are an environmental and community development consulting firm with staff serving First Nation, Métis, and Inuit communities coast to coast to coast. Our team works alongside Indigenous nations across Canada, providing technical guidance, regulatory advice, peer reviews, planning, and negotiation strategy in relation to major resource development projects. 
We are a company of Indigenous and non-Indigenous environmental, cultural heritage, planning, and regulatory experts committed to braiding Indigenous knowledge with Western science to further our clients' goals of prosperity, stewardship, and jurisdiction. All this is to say, in short, we are an eclectic blend of idealists, uh, pragmatists, scientists, artists, ex-hippies, ex-corporate cogs, um, all with a collective commitment to doing good work and trying to do good work in the world in general. And that brings me to me. So my name is Christina Anarita Carrier McCoy. I'm the eldest daughter of a Napolitan Calabrese Italian immigrant father and a multi-generational Irish Northern Canadian Timmins raised mama. Um, I like to highlight my ancestry because I think it has played a significant role in why I'm here today talking about archaeology and the role that cultural and ancestral history plays in defining individual and community identity. Through my own life experiences, and in particular through the lessons that I've learned while working with Indigenous peoples, I've come to believe that every person has an inherent right to tell their story, and that the story of who you are is intrinsically connected to where you've come from and where you want to go. That a home is sometimes not a house, it is a community. That ancestral history can be experienced outside of reading and listening to stories. That it can be felt, and it can be lived through the land, through the water, through relationships and through actions. I want those of you listening to my presentation today to take a moment right now before I really continue to think about how you identify yourself and your own history, how you tell your story. Is your story tied to a place? Is it tied to individuals? Is it tied to language, to a community? I want everyone to keep their own story in mind while I continue this presentation. And perhaps at the end, we can circle back like Michelle said, I think it's important to tell those stories. Um, and it, it really does bring us closer together to understanding that that really is what this is. It's a big story. I'm also going to be taking a few seconds um, at the end of each slide to go through what each photo I used um, on the slides are, because I think it's just kind of fun. Um, and also, I don't really get the chance to really show off these photos all that, all that often. So I'm going to take this opportunity. Um, so this photo was taken along the shore of the Mackenzie River near the Beluga Estuary where the salt water of the Arctic Ocean meets the fresh water of the Mackenzie River and provides a warm water um, area for belugas to birth their calves. This shoreline has been inhabited by Nuvialuit peoples for time immemorial. I took this photo a few hours after a polar bear had come to check out our site. Um, and you can't really tell from the photo because I didn't use any kind of scale. I'm a bad archaeologist. I should have put a scale beside it, but it's like, uh, it was a huge footprint. Okay, back to, back to the stuff. So let's start off by outlining the regulatory framework archaeology abides by within Ontario. Now, when I say legislative landscape, what I mean is the gambit of rules, laws, regulations that kind of outline uh, what a coworker says is the art of the possible. It's the portfolio of rules and legislative acts created by a government with jurisdiction to exercise its authority within any given sphere or landscape of activity. In this case, I'm going to be talking specifically about Ontario and a subsection of Ontario's legislative landscape as it relates to archaeology and Indigenous participation. Um, I want to highlight as well that I was kind of conflicted about what we even called this webinar because I need to acknowledge that participation in a process does not necessarily mean control of said process. Uh, and so Indigenous led archaeology might be a misnomer. However, I also want to reiterate that what I said earlier, I'm kind of hoping that this presentation can highlight where the current opportunities are within the system that exists. But I also want to encourage conversation and hope for what an improved legislative landscape can look like and should look like in the future. So I think it's worth taking just a couple of minutes here to go over a very brief federal history of archaeological legislation in Canada, um, because you might be wondering how it compares to the states or other countries. So during the rush to create national parks in 1885, the Archaeological Survey of Canada and the Historic Site Services were created. 
as I'm sure really no one's surprised, both of those commissions were focused on post-contact colonizer sites and did not really consider Indigenous history at all. The federal government then had its first foray into legislating cultural protections during the creation and implementation of the Indian Act with an amendment made in 1927 that prohibited the acquisition or defacement of graves, totem poles, rock art, and carved house posts. However, this Indian Act amendment only applied to those materials that were already situated on reserve land. So anything outside of designated reserve land was not considered protected by this amendment. During the 1960s, given the global political climate of the time, there was yet another rush to identify and protect what was called the Canadian identity. Because of this, the federal government dumped money into searching for and protecting post-contact colonial archeological sites and historic buildings. It wasn't until the 1990s that the then Ministry of Travel and Tourism estimated that there were maybe over a thousand historic sites being uncovered yearly. The methodologies and recording at this point in time were, and I quote, based on the intuitive knowledge of archeologists. And unfortunately, in many ways, this is kind of still the methodological basis today. In Ontario, it wasn't until 2003 that the first standards and guidelines for consultant archeologists were drafted. These are what I'm going to focus on today, as this document is the legislative framework that influences all of cultural resource management archaeology in Ontario. And I also want to pause here and say that from this point forward, I really am just going to call it CRM because cultural resource management um, is a mouthful. So on that note, let's define the difference here. I started my archaeological career in 2016 while I was still in my undergrad at U of T. I was given a most sudden and amazing opportunity to take part in Dr. Max Friesen's Arctic Char project in the Northwest Territories, where I spent the summer excavating the archaeological Inuvialuit site of Kupak, which is what you see on uh, your screen right now. I was 21 years old. This is my first time leaving the province. It was my first time camping. Uh, it was my first field season of archaeology at all. It was also the first time I was able to spend months becoming friends with and learning from members of an Indigenous community. And without realizing it at the time, I was learning about the deeply intimate and the personal connection that these friends of mine and their community had to the lands, the water, and to their history and ancestors. The photo you see on screen right now is the uncovered wooden cruciform shaped house that makes up the Kukpak site. Um, to give a little bit more background, uh, cruciform as in you know, the shape of a cross. So. As you can see those kind of rectangular shapes, those are benches. And so if you can imagine um, that the walls of this cruciform shaped house would have fallen in. And so what you're seeing is a wall fall on top of what would have been a bench. And when we were excavating in archeology, span you, you go down section by section. And so this is the, the first kind of layer of actually seeing the, the site itself. And we spent the rest of the summer methodically going lower and lower and uncovering what was underneath those benches. So when I graduated with my archaeology degree, I had the two choices that most archaeology grads face. I could stay in academia or I could venture forth into the world of CRM. Um, I mentioned my time working in Northwest Territories because it really had such a resounding impact on me as a person, but as an archaeologist. I saw the kind of work and research that could be done when the Indigenous community was not only part of the planning process, but when it was the community itself that was pushing for the research project to be done in the first place. Academic archaeology is archaeological work mostly funded for research incentives. These can be funded by technically anybody. However, most often the work is funded by universities. Cultural resource management is not academic archaeology, and the work is not funded with research incentives nor community wellness in mind. The work is funded most often by development proponents, developers whose key incentives are moving their development projects forward. Whether that means opening a new mine or rerouting a pipeline, building a subdivision or expanding a road, they all have one thing in common. Time is money. And the quicker these pre-development phases go, the quicker they can begin making money on those investments. Archaeological work from the very onset of any development project is seen as simply one more hurdle the proponent has to get past within that impact assessment an environmental assessment process. A proponent is then required to hire a CRM firm or a licensed archaeologist 
to begin the archaeological assessment process. So this is kind of where the fun begins and what we're going to dive into a bit more. The Standards and Guidelines for Consultant Archaeologists, or SNG, or simply Standards and Guidelines, is a manual used to instruct licensed archaeologists in Ontario. The key thing we all have to understand about the Standards and Guidelines is that it uses deliberately vague language in order to give wiggle room to practicing archaeologists. Now, speaking as an archaeologist myself, sometimes science requires wiggle room. It's necessary. Other times, the wiggle room can be used to cut corners. An excerpt from the standards and guidelines um, that I want to highlight and, and have everyone keep in mind moving forward is this. The guidelines give guidance or advice on good practice beyond the requirements of the standards or under certain circumstances provide an acceptable alternative to the standards when stated conditions are met. Following the guidelines is considered to be a matter of professional judgment on the part of the licensee. As per the Ontario Heritage Act, CRM archaeologists explicitly, legally, work for their client. This client is almost always a land developer or resource extractor. Under Regulation 806 of the Ontario Heritage Act, a consultant archaeologist means an archaeologist who enters in an agreement with a client to carry out or supervise archaeological fieldwork on behalf of and for the client. As per the standards and guidelines, these clients are explicitly land developers, proponents, they're not communities. This caveat has created an industry of archaeological companies that are hired by developers to carry out archaeological work that is strictly incentivized by development timelines. Now, in my experience, the legislative framework forces archaeologists into a social mitigation position where pressure from the fear of losing a contract will often outweigh an individual archaeologist's interests in meaningful consultation. In accordance with the Ontario Heritage Act and with the support of the SNGs, a consultant archaeologist is often forcefully reminded that they do, in fact, work for who's paying them, which is the development proponent. So what to do? How do we, you know, how do you push against this outdated framework? There are several avenues to attack this issue from, depending on where you are coming from. And I've spoken quite a bit about archaeology community but I wanna focus the next half of this presentation on pressure points available for indigenous communities and how you and your community can put pressure on the province and how you can possibly take back control archeological narrative and heritage value determinations. So I also wanna highlight and pause here for a second and say that my community is the archeology span community. I come from a background of CRM archeology span and the archaeologists that I have had the privilege to work with during my time as a CRM archaeologist are most often the feistiest, most amazing, incredible group of misfits that I've ever known. But they're forced into a position where they're not allowed to be themselves. Um, they're not allowed to push because that's who's paying the bills. And I just want to say to the archaeologists that are listening right now, if you identify as a CRM archaeologist, I am not attacking you nor a CRM firm. What I'm highlighting here is that we, as a community, are forced into a position that often I find we don't want to be in. So before I continue, I want to point out this cool photo. Um, what you're seeing is a very clear stratigraphic profile flipped upside down from a shovel test pit that co-workers and I were completing um, about two hours north of Timmins in Teguatagmo Nation territory. When it's still on the ground, this soil profile would be flipped, so you can imagine it upside down. Uh, what you're seeing at the top there is a sandy layer, what we would identify as subsoil, followed by an ash layer that's uh, likely the result of a forest fire, covered by organic topsoil and grasses. So while not always required, there are a few things you can expect to see happen before a project is really ready to enter the regulatory process. The time between when a proponent has a project idea and when it enters the regulatory process can be a challenging time for Indigenous communities who may be affected by a project. Although the proponent should be engaging early and often, it's not legally required. So as a result, the community may not even be aware of a project until they receive a request to review permits or have contractors show up in their territory. Some proponents will try to avoid engaging with an Indigenous government intentionally. 
Others do it out of ignorance or a lack of understanding of how their project may impact traditional territory. But in either case, while responsibility should not lie on your community to proactively engage with proponents, ensuring early engagement is almost always a benefit. It is as early as this stage that active involvement within the archeological process can be solidified through process agreements, relationship agreements, impact benefit agreements, or tailored impact statement guidelines. Um, if these are processes that you or members of your community would like help navigating, do feel free to please email me or anyone at SVS and we'd be more than happy to help you understand the processes and how to strategically work through them. Uh, during my time at SVS, I have been actively involved working with Indigenous community clients to solidify agreements in these early stages that can ensure active consultation and participation during all stages of archaeological work. Um, right now, that includes a desktop pre-field work research, um, hopefully onto active involvement in stages two to four in the coming field season. So these early agreements are really the sort of first opportunity that you have to lay out ground rules and expectations for involvement with archaeological work. Depending on desire and community capacity, of course, participation can be shaped in the way that you want it to be shaped. If that means capacity funding to take part in writing of reports or hiring to be a part of the fieldwork team itself, or support in developing a position for maybe a cultural monitor, that is, those are all things that can be strategically negotiated. Um, again, quick pause, because this is probably the best photo in the entire presentation. Um, this is probably the peak of my career. This is a perfect example of a one by one meter square unit dug for a stage four archeological assessment um, completed just outside of Brantford during the line 10 track 73 Embridge project. It's great. Okay, so speaking of fieldwork, um, there are other pressure points to kind of keep in mind and a few strategies worth exploring when considering what active participation might look like for your community. The Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation are an incredible example um, of a community prioritizing significant involvement throughout the archaeological process in Southern Ontario. Uh, unfortunately, MCFN was incredibly busy this time of year, so we weren't able to add their voice to this presentation, but I do actively urge all listeners to look at their model as an example for what kind of participation can be possible within the current legislative landscape. Um, during my years as a CRM archaeologist, I can honestly say that I learned more about the land and its history from cultural monitors of MCFN than I learned from any other teacher in my life. Um, in 2018, MCFN wrote and published their own standards and guidelines for archaeology, which actually outlined the extent of change throughout the last decade, but also represents one of the few examples where there were clearly defined roles community members involved in the archaeological fieldwork could play uh, with respect to representing their community. It also clearly defines processes of decision making by MCFN, Department of Consultation and Accommodation, DOCA for short. Um, additionally, the document also outlines um, that there are certain decisions that are for elected representatives and or elders within the community to make. Um, this document is available online at the MCFN website. Uh, while the hiring of Indigenous peoples directly as field crew has not really been widespread and has remained fairly limited, the practice of having an Indigenous community member observe and often participate in archaeological fieldwork has become commonplace in Southern Ontario. And we really can thank MCFN for that big push. Um, another avenue for involvement in archaeological process is through the licensing system in Ontario. Um, this is something that I find not a lot of people are aware of. So while this licensing system does exemplify the sort of glass ceiling we can come to expect from archaeology, there is a benefit for an individual to apply to obtain what's called an avocational license. These licenses can be accredited to anyone interested in archaeology and they allow access both to a series of um, journals and Ontario archaeological databases. They kind of give you access to things, uh, but they also provide the opportunity to enter into a mentorship relationship with an archaeologist holding a professional license. Uh, the professional license is only obtainable for uh, consultants and researchers who have completed a master's degree and several years of field work. Um, but in between these two types of licenses is something called an applied research license. An applied research license is often the license held by field directors and researchers who did not complete a master's degree, but it can also be obtained by having your avocational license um, after completing several years of mentorship under a P licensee, after completing field work and lab work, um, you can obtain an R license without having uh, attended university for archeology. span 
So sometimes the ministry seems to have a moving goalpost in what they consider to be ample experience. Um, really is different year to year and how many R licenses they're handing out that year, whether they want to admit that or not, it's true. Um, if obtaining an avocation license though is something that you are interested in, again, please feel free to email me or call me. I would be absolutely happy to discuss the steps that it would take for you to do that. The last fieldwork pressure point I wanted to discuss is technical reviews. Um, reviewing studies done during the impact assessment project might be something your community has experience with and is already doing, but I find that archeological reports often manage to sneak through being peer reviewed uh, at this stage. And this is a pressure point that you can easily apply weight to. Capacity funding provided through IAC or proponents can be used to support the review and the comments on these reports. If you've been left out at this point from the field work and you know the reports are already written, it kind of is the step that you can take to ensure that things are in line with, um, with your community's interests and where you kind of want to see the archaeology going in the future. Again, if there is a need or an interest in having these technical reviews completed or you want to talk more about that, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we'd be happy to chat. So let me see, how quick did I speak? 532, not bad. Okay. I put a few articles here. Uh, these are just some of my favorite articles. They are um, excellent reads. They really kind of highlight some of the topics that I was talking about today. Um, if you want a copy of these articles, I didn't say this, but I'm saying it, just email me and I will send you a copy of, uh, of this article, of these articles. Oh, I also skipped talking about these sweet pictures. Not that one, but you should see it again. Um, this picture is, um, again, the Mackenzie River, that same shoreline, the really fascinating thing that happens along the Mackenzie River, and actually the reason we were out there and the, the funding reason for that project is because due to climate change, erosion has really picked up, um, especially in, in the north. And so what you're seeing here is a beach littered with bones. Um, Right in the front of the very bottom there is actually a beluga whale um, ear bone. It's kind of just like inside and it's bigger, like on humans it's super small, but in a beluga it's obviously big. Um, and yeah, as we were walking along the, the coast there, there's just bones absolutely everywhere. They're now out of context, of course, they would have been washed out from those sites um, that I showed you that we were excavating and brought out into the river and then brought back in, or they might be falling out as as we're walking along the site um, and then the same thing goes for here uh, these are artifacts that were found along the beach they're out of context so what that means uh, to the non-archaeologists is that it, they are artifacts surely they're they're clearly uh, tools that have been made and used but we don't know where they came from um, in terms of which site they came from or where they were in the site so they are now out of context. So these were, were recorded and then left where they were. I also included this slide to talk about um, folks making a difference and the way that you can get more involved right now. Um, I really want to highlight my just absolute biggest academic and professional crush ever, Dr. Keisha Subrin, who is a proud Métis woman um, a professor at the Department of Anthropology, University of Alberta. Um, I'm sure folks have heard her name before. She's also the director of the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology. She's the co-director of the Situated Knowledges, Indigenous Peoples and Place Signature Area. She chairs the Unmarked Graves and Working Group, um, part of the Canadian Archaeological Association. She's also the co-author of an absolutely wonderful book called Archaeologies of the Heart, which she wrote alongside three other remarkable academics, um, Jane Baxter, Natasha uh, Lyons, and Sonia Adelaide. So highly recommend uh, looking her up and checking out the work that she's doing right now. She's incredibly impressive, um, really inspirational. Um, and she often has talks that are, that are free and open access as well. So I, I highly recommend everybody check her out if you haven't already. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that pathways to becoming an archaeologist, I find that there is this, uh, this, this idea that becoming an archaeologist is sort of far gone or far reaching after you've hit a certain age that, you know, you have to go back to school in order to become an archaeologist. 
And I'm not saying that schooling isn't important. It is, it, it does a lot, but at the same time, becoming an archeologist does have to do a lot with just the practice of it and learning and being um, on the land and listening. And I think that that process of obtaining an avocational license and kind of seeing if that's something that you find interesting um, is absolutely a pathway to making a difference. And it would be helpful to have more folks um, pursuing those sorts of licenses so that we can have more voices within the ar academic and archaeological community, as opposed to just, you know, a, a bunch of academics. Um, the other thing that I highly recommend and I, I push everyone to do is attend conferences and ask hard questions. Um, it is consistent that when I attend conferences, there is kind of a quiet a lot of the time after presentations um people you know don't really seem like they want to ask necessarily the hard questions but I, I think sometimes conferences really are the place that people can talk about the issues and kind of push back on some of the norms and so whenever there is an opportunity I highly recommend if you have the ability to to attend these conferences and listen to the topics that are are being brought up and and raise issues when you see the issues um, it's worth pushing back and the last thing too is requesting information whenever information has not been provided. It seems like a very uh, basic sentence, but you have every right to ask what archeology span has been done, why it was done the way it was done, where the reports are, where the artifacts are. Um, it is completely within your community's right to request that information and to be given that information. And um, I wanna just encourage everyone to do so when they feel that they want that information on hand. So we have uh, my contact information here. We'll also pop it in the chat. Uh, SVS also provides um, archeological services. I am the archeologist at SVS. So we just went over some of the things that we do. Uh, we also have a bi-weekly newsletter featuring funding opportunities on our blog. So you can check that out. And we also have a bunch of free ebook series. Um, so all of that, is just free. Just check that out. If you found this talk interesting, you want to talk more again, like I said, please call me or email me. Like that is, that's not a, a charged thing. Like, please just reach out. Um, I'm really happy to talk about this kind of, this kind of thing and kind of figure out where, where maybe we can support you in the future. Um, yeah. And so I'm going to open it up to questions and I'm also going to stop sharing my screen because I can't see anybody and I don't like that. It's not my favorite thing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great, hey, thank you, Christina. Um, we had a couple of questions in the chat, starting with Ken. Uh, he had a couple of questions about the benches, um, timing of the bench site and the logs of the benches, like confirming if they were cedar. Um, maybe you could clarify a bit, uh, Ken, on that, or uh, Christina, if you wanted to go in more detail up there. Yeah, um, so great question, because I love talking about this site. Um, the wood for those benches, so it, this is about, um, it's about 800 years old, this site. Um, the wood for the benches is really interesting, because where this site is, is it is past the tree line. So there are no trees um, that grow there. All those trees that you see have been washed down the Mackenzie River from south and they've been like resourced in and pulled in and used um, as building material. And so the trees that you're seeing are a whole bunch of different species of trees. And when we were there, um, we actually had a PhD candidate, um, Remy, Remy Morales from Paris. France and he was a dendrochronologist and his entire PhD work was actually studying those trees and um, cutting in and, and seeing exactly how old each of those trees were, what kind of trees they were, um, and trying to figure out if there was a, a preference given to certain species of trees and if certain tree species were used as different materials. So if there was a, a preferred material for floor or, or walls or um, yeah, and he's, I think he is still working on that. I, I always hesitate whenever anyone's doing their PhD work to say like, yeah, it's done. Cause I don't know if it's done, but, um, 
he was he was doing really cool work and I think that that is what he ended up doing his PhD on so yeah I I highly recommend looking him up I'll I'll drop his name in the chat before we end today so that if anyone's interested in seeing more of that work um yeah him and Taylor Thornton a uh, very very excellent archaeologist great um looks like uh Bonnie did you have a question and we could go back into the chat after that I'm just trying to see on the upper level understanding of your work, Christine. Um, I was also looking at as a perspective of residential lands when they're sold and there's archeological uh, claim underneath. So uh, you didn't touch on that unless I missed it and I wouldn't be sure how to navigate that or work with the city and buyers because is that land now untouchable or just needs mm -hmm. to hire mm -hmm. someone to investigate like it, i'm curious about that because living on the west coast there's quite a opportunity to you know invest in land but then you know there's archaeological discoveries under there that say don't touch it so i'm not sure how to navigate that and and if i worked on your side of things how would i help a community navigate that both ways yeah, yeah, that's totally, that's a very fair question. And to answer it, um, I don't know if you'll love my answer, but it is so variable depending on each province and territory. Um, and that is kind of the, unfortunately, that is the truth that it is a different navigation depending on where you are and also what kind of purchase has taken place too. Um, so I can't speak for the other provinces strictly speaking I think I have a rough idea with BC but I I'd have to I don't want I don't want to be quoted with BC knowledge but Ontario um in Ontario basically there is there are bylaws that kind of strictly say that if there is a land purchase um if it's being purchased for residential building so if there's an individual like a private purchase um and they can guarantee that there's no uh there's no foundation digging there's no uh, as you know, let's say it's being purchased and they're turning it into a park and they're not going to really be doing much else with it. Basically, it can kind of slip past um, going through any of the process that requires breaking ground, I want to say. However, that being said, whenever there's development on any purchase of land, it does have to enter into the impact, possibly into an impact assessment. Um, and during an impact assessment, there is the requirement to have archaeological assessment done at the early stages. And so that means um, before any, any ground is broken, that's kind of your stage one that we call it, which is a desktop research. So that would be um, usually it's an archaeology company that's been hired to do that. And it's, it's desktop saying, you know, they're using maps and they're using um, sometimes an indigenous knowledge and other times not. Um, and highlighting and saying, you know, we know that there's a high chance that this area has archaeological potential. Um, and then in that case, it moves forward into the next stages. And the stage two in Ontario is survey work, and that's um, breaking ground, doing, you know, the next step. Um, and it goes up from there. But I understand what you're saying too, like where, where and how do you navigate to, to really help if you're in that position where you know, what do you do next and how, how do you reach out and how do you, you know, not cause harm in the case of, of land purchase. And I would say the best, the best solution is honestly always reaching out to the community of that area. Like that has been my experience is that most often, um, you know, they're going to have a better idea of how, how they would like to engage with that land. And, and if, you know, they want archaeology to be done before anything else happens. Um, and that's kind of one of the undertones of really my presentation is that I think there is a how things are done now and a how things really should be done moving forward. And it's kind of finding where that line is. So while there's no legal requirement to reach out to the nation, you know, or the community, it should be required. And I think that's where we can kind of be making those steps to, to making that the normal so that eventually that is the normal and that gets built into the laws and that gets built into the legislation and really kind of just makes that active change. Does that help at all, Bonnie? I don't know if I rambled a little bit, but I, I ramble. 
Oh, sure. You need the definite. Um, every province will be different. And that from both sides of things, you know, in navigating, developing a property, it will vary on what the community has an interest in. And it's continuously evolving and changing. But yeah. uh, on a level yeah. of helping others, there, you know, there's the uh, desktop, you said, groundwork yeah. first and mapping and and there are those procedures to help someone make a decision or guide them through it so it's you gave a pretty good understanding of where you could start anyways thank you okay awesome great um so the next question is from ken um earlier you had a question about excavation sites he is wondering if any reach back more than fourteen thousand years not that i've worked on is my is my answer um, not that i've worked on but okay um then laura is wondering if you could send out a link to mcfn standards and guidelines i sure can laura okay and joel wondering the percentage of work sites uh, yield archaeological discoveries oh boy um in ontario uh like a lot I think like I mean it really is dependent on where the site's happening I mean that that's that makes sense but I mean as an archaeologist there's a few different points um, when I was talking about when I used that sentence before of archaeological potential um, it, to, to kind of really base level explain what that means from an archaeology perspective is that um, is the parcel of land that you're about to to develop near water. That's a very basic straight line arrow one. If it's near water, there's archaeological potential. Um, and that just makes sense. I mean, you know, rivers, lakes, anything that's people have always lived near water. Um, and so that automatically ticks a box of archaeological potential. Um, there's also land formations and whatnot, too. So for instance, in southern Ontario, we have what we call the golden horseshoe, which is the um, the land that runs kind of north of Toronto in a horseshoe formation around um, Lake Ontario. And there's tons of archaeology that happens around that area. And the reason being is one, fertile uh, soils and, and active um, useful trees and berries and plants and animals, but also it's just a, it's a good place to live in terms of weather um, and it's near water. And so when we're doing archaeology in southern Ontario right now um, it's people want to live in the same places that they've always wanted to live and so development which then requires archaeology um, and as development kind of grows and blows up from southern Ontario and it keeps pushing and pushing and pushing north we're finding that I mean it's so often that you're finding sites um, it's, it's pretty consistent. I mean, the really unfortunate truth is that this most often when I'm on a job or a project that doesn't have anything, it's because that area has been previously developed during a time period when there were no legal requirements to report any sorts of sites or artifacts found. So a lot of the hydro corridors that were built in the sixties, um, those just ripped right through, um, a lot of, you know, traditional land that indigenous communities knew was being used. And unfortunately that, that those resources, that entire area is just stripped. Um, and that happens in Southern Ontario too. It's less so with hydro corridors, but you see it with um, the older development projects and stuff too, especially Toronto, um, anywhere North York area was really kind of developed really quick and, and not, uh, not with science or, or really any people in mind other than the developers. So that I hope that answers your question. I think um, Southern Ontario has been populated forever. So there's there's always been people here. And so there is always sites. There's always sites. And you had a follow-up question. Um, how far back do these, do these records go? And for the, the Niagara Peninsula? Niagara Peninsula. So you know what? I, that's actually the point of debate. I will send. Um, I'm going to send that list of articles, and I highlight. Let me pull up actually which one I'm thinking of. 
Neil Ferris, who is a professor at Western, um, he does a fantastic job outlining all of the different debates that there are between the different archaeological records and and whatnot. And I know that, you know, I'm giving you that archaeology maybe answer, which everyone loves us for, but that is my answer is that there there is debate. Um, and plus, I also want to highlight like the archaeological record is not necessarily the record. Like I think archaeologists are kind of people who will only say something is certain so far as we have like tangible evidence in front of us, which is not necessarily the best or the right answer. Um, and that's something that I think archaeologists have grown and learned from Indigenous communities is that, you know, it, it doesn't just because you don't have that quote unquote physical item to say, hey, this dates to that doesn't mean that it that doesn't mean that that's the answer. Do you know what I mean? So so my long and short, I always say that I'm like, oh, yeah, the short form of this. And then I talk for 15 minutes, but is I will send that link um, to all those articles. And I, I highly recommend checking out um, any of Neil Ferris's work. Um, he talks about that quite a bit. Great. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, sorry. I'm just driving. I'm listening. Um, so uh, my name is Mandy. I'm the uh, archaeologist for Hiawatha First Nation, uh, born and bred. Uh, my question is kind of relates to what you were just talking about. Uh, so we're well underway in the archaeological process in the, and uh, consulting and uh, sending out liaisons to monitor. Most of my time now is spent uh, doing technical review of reports. And um, because we've been doing this for quite some time now, we are just inundated. We, we don't have capacity to uh, address all of the reports that are coming in our way. But I have um, a way of prioritizing them. And the problem that I'm finding most common that I'm fighting against is the whole ethnicity issue. Um, I'm sure, you know, uh, Southern archeologists are well aware of the Iroquoian bias yeah. in the archeological record. and. Um, you know, based on colonial records and, you know, going way, way back. How, can you just talk a little bit about that? I'm just, I'm really yeah. struggling to try and make archaeologists try to even acknowledge this bias. And, um, you know, I, I feel like our history, like the Anishinaabe people's history is being, wipe away one copy and pasted report at a time. So I was just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Absolutely, Mandy. Um, so first of all, I'm, I'm sorry that you're having to experience that because that is like incredibly aggravating. And I, um, yeah, well, I can, I can empathize, and try and sympathize, I can, you know what I mean? So all this is to say, um, it is frustrating and I think that the fact that you are already doing these reviews is actually a step for like a step more than most archaeology firms are really expecting to even see. And so I want to say on the positive end of things, having been a CRM archaeologist myself and knowing sometimes these the, the time crunch, and you're right, the copy and paste, because it is copy and paste. Let's be honest, it is. It's, you know, you've got 40 different reports that you need to fill out and your boss is telling you that they all need to be done by Friday. And oh, well, I'll just copy and paste this section because it's more or less the same. So calling out that copy and paste culture within these reports is I actually think one of the earliest steps that we collectively can, can make to pushing um, not only the archeology span community, but at, in the long run developers to actually acknowledge that this kind of science is not a copy and paste science. And so the way that I would navigate going about that is it's frustrating. It's hard because if you're saying that you guys are struggling with capacity as well right now, I totally understand that. And that means that, you know, having to prioritize one report over another, it kind of feels, um, feels like you don't want to miss anything and you want to make sure that you're, 
you're guaranteeing that you're making your voice heard in those reports. I would say that calling them out on it, highlighting the issues, as you say that you are, and saying, you know, this language, I'm not recommending that this language be changed. I'm saying that this language needs to be changed. Um, and that and that kind of pushback is the sort of thing that I think that they're not expecting um, and I think needs to be more commonplace. So yeah, um, it's a difficult one. And it's something that I've also definitely um, also butted heads with other archeologists about that exact topic. Um, I think it is definitely about reiterating that they need to acknowledge whether or not they agree. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they agree or not. At the end of the day, their role is to include in a report all of the information that is relevant to that area, that parcel of land, as they, they would call it. So they need to be including that. If that means that in that report, they're saying, you know, alternative this or you know including every single different stage and they need to be doing that so I think what you're doing is the is the right push um it's just about finding the capacity and the ability to like address all of those different reports and I I feel you with that and I I think there's something to be said about if this is something that you know your community is having difficulties with, it might be worthwhile in those early stages of these projects um, to be including, you know, the request for that capa like capacity funding during IBAs, um, during impact assessment processes to highlight that, you know, your community needs that support and you need to be able to, to maybe hire more for that or just support even those who are already working on those reports to be able to, to give them that time to be able to review. Um, I think that's something that maybe in the earlier stages you could also push for because um, that capacity funding can extend to to include that sort of techn technical review. Does that help at all? Yeah, no, I, it's, it's great just to hear you acknowledge it, to be perfectly honest. Um, it's, it's something that I spend most of my days doing is just picking apart the historical section of the archaeological report. Uh, you know, I, a lot of archaeologists are amenable to changing space, but I also spend a great deal of time sourcing references, right? Because if I don't, they will put in their, their views and opinions on, on things based on, you know, uh, classifications that were, you know, created in the 60s. But yeah. they will, if I don't have the sources and references ready to go it's like you know like i said they will put in the the iroquoian stuff and then based on oral history based yeah. on you know what i mean and almost like to lower it in a way so yeah it, it's a huge issue it's definitely something that i'm pushing back against i i've started uh requesting capacity funding for my report reviews and i haven't gotten a whole lot of pushback yet so that's that's promising but uh, yeah, no, it's it's good just to know that other people are aware of this because I feel like I'm I'm fighting against an institution here. Yeah, and I mean you are right. I I think the part part of uh, what I've really realized uh, through this work is that you know without change uh, to concise legislation, without without these sorts of frameworks actually incorporating any sort of indigenous worldviews. They're really just continuing that sort of legacy of, well, your science isn't as good as ours. And, and that's the, that's the, the pushback that I think the more that we have, the more change we'll see right now. I, on that exact topic, actually, Mandy, I was just working with a client and we were pushing back on some language um, from a report. And we did have them change um, a good portion of it to acknowledge that, you know, the art, like I said earlier, the archaeological record is really just one way of, of knowing. And it's also not completely accurate too. like they like archaeologists be the first people to admit that, um, you know, this sort of si this sort of science is is open. It, it's it's always changing and always moving and it should be always open for additional information. So, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that.
There's actually an interesting article by uh, Darlene Johnson. It's called Who Was Where When? And it basically goes into the, the problem with using colonial records um, yeah. simply due to the fact that what one person or group called themselves is not necessarily what 50 other European um, settlers would have called them. And so they may be completely wrong. And these are what the articles that get cited over and over and over again until they become true. So that's another thing I wanted to point out is that, you know, these reports are people's opinions, but they are being portrayed as fact. And that's like a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow, it seems like. Yeah. Coming in here. So, um, that brings us to four yeah. o'clock. Um, we do have one more question in the chat from Joel. Just wondering if you have time to answer that. i uh, wondering about the Hydro One, just going ahead in the 1960s is amazing. And when did they start to do archaeology? So Hydro One sort of, uh, Hydro One, Hydro One, I have, <laughs> <laughs> Did that tell you enough? My tone. Okay, so Hydra One um, has kind of been uh, sort of sort of tied to that. Um, when I was discussing the sort of federal uh, history of how how things have moved over the last several decades for um, what's acknowledged as as valuable and how land or resources are viewed as valuable depending on the time period, Hydra One kind of falls into that same category where they're a very unique situation where like they're a company, but they're also very in bed with provincial legislation and how those sorts of moves and changes affect their their company. In some ways, they're they're almost like like part of the government in in and of themselves. So, when did they start doing archaeology? Um, they would have started being held to the fire um, in the '80s when there was the first sort of steps towards. Um, having archaeological requirements. Um, in recent years, Hydro One has actually been probably one of the more better uh, proponents to work with. Um, partially, I mean, maybe this is my cynical opinion, but partially because they have the money and they don't want the drama. Um, and so in, in some cases, I find that Hydro One uh, will is more willing to acknowledge that they need to do a lot of the steps as opposed to these sort of smaller proponents that are kind of always trying to cut corners. Um, so they would have started in the 80s and they would have been held to the same legislative requirements um, that the rest of uh, development companies were held to. And they are still held to those same same requirements. They they do have a habit now of, of having a bit more money behind them to support um, archaeological work. So in my experience the last few years, I, I have noticed that they, they're probably one of the proponents that do support um, positive change in this industry. Great. Um, thank you, Christina, um, for sharing with us today. And thank you everybody for joining us for our last Links to Learning webinar. Uh, we'll be continuing our webinar series for Webinar Wednesdays starting April 12th. Um, thank you again. I hope you, everybody has a great afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you.